verses 6 through 8. And they say this. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let us feel your presence and know that's ultimately what we are seeking. Safety, love, grace that only you can provide. That nothing or no one in this world can provide that. Help us, Father, to, to feel your, your presence during this time. Allow our worship to be pleasing in your eyes. Allow our worship to be lifted up for your glory, for your love, for your abounding love for each of us. That we know that you're always there with open arms for us. Throughout the week ahead, whatever we struggle with, whatever highs, whatever lows we have, Father, that you're there with us. That you're our safety net. That you're there to show us the way. Help us to, to get out of worship, get out of the message that Pastor Ben has, what we need, Father, and what we need to continue to grow closer to you in our relationship. We ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. Be with you all this morning. If you can, please stand as we join together in worship. Good morning. You may be seated. <clears throat> this morning, as we uh, prepare for tithes and offerings, our uh, we do have a plate at the back of the sanctuary uh, for those that are present here. Um, also, if, for those online, you can uh, give through our giving tab, raynaz.com, and use the tab there, or you can mail a check by uh, <laughs> mail a check mail a check uh, to four ten Blake, or you could drop it by anytime during the week as well. Um, this, this week, our scripture comes out of Mark, chap, Mark chapter 12, 41 through 44. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in a large sum, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, 
out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This this scripture paints a, a very beautiful picture, if you'd say, of trust in God's provision. And Christ's response to the act of faith demonstrates God's feelings towards our sacrifice and our generosity. Another interesting point here is that Jesus went out of his way to sit and watch the people giving their offerings. His interest in our giving is not careless. He watches, he recognizes more than we do of how our faith is revealed in our habits of giving. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to give out of the abundance that you have given us. Lord, we ask that you uh, that you be with us as we give, that, that you uh, care for us in those times of needs. Lord, we just help us to recognize that and recognize the, the opportunity that we have. Lord, we just ask that you'll be with us throughout the rest of this service. Be with Pastor Ben as he brings us a message. Amen. If you can, please stand as we continue in worship. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is. 
team time in our service today where we call on that powerful name of Jesus time of prayer time of praise and testimony sharing what God is doing has been doing and is doing in your lives and so this morning I want to give you that opportunity to do just that. Share any prayer requests, any praises, any testimonies. Who wants to start? Victor. His name is Terry. So your son, Victor, doing well. We're praying for Terry. Um, and you said what type of cancer? I'm sorry. Colon cancer. Colon cancer. Okay. Okay. We'll be praying for Terry here in these next, next several weeks. All right. Any others this morning? Yes, Kim. Okay. Praying for Kim's grandmother who's in the hospital with kidney and bladder infections. And so we'll be praying for her today. Any others? Pray for Barbara Searle's friend who lost her son in the traffic accident last night. Was that local or Colorado Springs? Colorado Springs. Okay. All right. Any others today? I want to be praying for uh, Dwayne and Wanda. They're traveling today. Uh, Dwayne's uncle passed away, and so they're traveling back for a funeral. Um, but he knew the Lord, so it, that's good. Um, but, you know, pray for them during this time as they travel and for their time together. Any others? It's Gloria. All right, pray for Gloria's friend. Her dad has cancer. She's been taking care of him, but things are not looking good at the moment. So we'll be praying for, for her today. Are there any others this morning? Yes. I agree. It's taking a toll on my life. <laughs> Was it? <laughs> okay. Pray for schools. We pray for teachers and students. Finish strong.
Yes. Praise the Lord. I love that. Um, last Sunday we were, sorry, I'm trying to talk and write notes. You ever do that? And it's, I don't know what I was trying to write there. Um, last Sunday we prayed for, um, for Sharon Bruner's nephew, Ricky, and surgery went well. He's at home recovering. And so all of that is has gone well, so we praise the Lord for that. Any others today? I'm smoking Okay. Any others? As always, I invite you to come to the altar. The altar is, is a place not of defeat. Altar is a place of victory. Because at the altar is where we lay these things. Trusting Jesus is going to come through on our behalf. That he's going to do what he's going to do. And so, in some ways, it's symbolic. We come with these requests and we lay them at the altar, trusting that God's going to do what he's going to do with it. So I invite you to come. Maybe for some of you, you need to do that as a testimony of faith, that God is doing just that. You're free to, to pray where you are as well, but let's come together as we, as we pray today. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this time together today. We're thankful for a place of worship. We're thankful for opportunities to worship. We're thankful, God, that you meet us here. Lord, we're thankful this morning that you care about each and every need. And that as we begin to lift these before you, you are already at work. So God, we thank you. Lord, this morning as we come to you, we come to you submitting our agendas. We submit our needs. We submit the way that we're praying about these things to your will, to your sovereignty, to your goodness. And Lord, you are faithful to meet us here today. So God, thank you. Lord, this morning we lift up these needs to you. We, we lift up Victor's nephew who's been diagnosed with cancer and is beginning treatment. Father, would you be with him today? Would you calm any fears? Would you bring your peace, Lord? And I pray, God, that you would make your presence known in his life in significant ways. We praise you, God, for the way that you were with Victor's son and the healing process that's begun there. Father, thanks. We ask that you continue to strengthen and fulfill your healing in his life. Father, we lift up Kim's grandmother to you today with the kidney and bladder infections. Lord, we we ask that you would heal those today. As she sits in, in the hospital and she's being treated, Lord, I pray that your presence is there with her. That your name would be glorified as a result of what you're doing in her life. Father, we pray that you are with Barb Searle's friend who's tragically lost her son today. Father, would you bring comfort? Would you bring peace? And in the pain and in the questioning, Father, I pray that your presence, Lord, would be enough. That you'd surround her with people that point her to you. Be with her today as well. We ask that you would be with Dwayne and Wanda as they travel today and the family as they gather for this funeral. We ask, God, that you would meet with them in the significant ways. That your hand of mercy be upon them as they all travel and as they gather. May it be a good time of reunion to celebrate a life well lived. So, Father, be with them today. Father, we pray 
for Gloria's friend whose dad is, has cancer. Father, would you bring hope? And not hope in our own agenda, but hope in a trust in you, that you are in control, that you are good. Father, I pray that you would strengthen Gloria's friend today, that you would help her as she cares for her dad. We pray that you are with her dad as well today, Father. We pray and ask for your healing according to your will. Father, thanks. Father, we praise you for the way that you've been with Dorothy over these last several weeks and her healing of her elbow. God, thank you for the way that you've worked that out. You are good. Father, we lift up Elaine and her unspoken request today. Father, you know the need. So Lord, would you begin work right now? We thank you, God, that you are a God that is active even if we don't have to speak the need. You know it. So Lord, thanks. Would you, would you be glorified in that situation? Father, we're, we're so thankful for our teachers in this school year, that, as crazy as it's been. But Lord, they're tired. And, and the students, they're tired. Father, would you strengthen each one today? Would you help them to finish strong? You instruct us out of Colossians to do these things for your glory. And so, Lord, I pray for your strength to do these things for your glory, for our teachers today, for our students, administrators. Lord, would you be with them today? Father, we, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for your providence. We thank you for your sovereignty, the way that you are in control despite what we see and know and understand. You're a God who can be trusted. You're a God who's able. You're a God who loves us beyond what we can imagine and comprehend. And you know and have what's best in mind for us. And so, Lord, today, these prayers we lift to you are prayers of submission to your goodness, to your sovereignty, to your control. We lay our agendas aside and invite you to work. Father, thank you. We love you. We ask these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. Thank you, Elaine. Well, this morning, we begin week two of a series that we began called Questions from Jesus. And last week, we, we introduced this. We, we talked about the ways that, um, that what we're supposed to do as we encounter these, uh, these next several weeks is wrestle with the way that Jesus asks these questions. Because we've discovered that, that Jesus asks questions not because he's trying to, to gain understanding, but usually these questions are a way for us to, um, to get to the heart of what Jesus is intending for us to capture in those moments. And oftentimes we discover that Jesus has a question behind the question. Does that make sense? He asks a question, but there's more to, to that question. There's an agenda behind it. There's something he's trying to capture our attention with. And so... Over these next couple of weeks, as we, as we continue this, I want you to keep that in mind, that there's this question behind the question, what Jesus asks when he has encountered these people. And so this morning, our text is from John chapter 5, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 15. And I was drawn to this uh, particular passage, and, and I really thought I had a good had a good pulse on what, what, uh, what Jesus was up to. And, and I read this, and I, and I felt pretty confident in a few things and um, really kind of had a sermon really prepared on, on, on this initially. So I'm going to explain some of my process here 
this week as I present this. And um, hopefully this makes sense to you as we spend our time together today. So John chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 1 through 15 this morning. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. That day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who, talked, who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I pray that you would uh, meet with us today. I pray that your words would come alive, that you would help me as I speak today, that it'd be your words and not mine, that our hearts and minds would be open to what you want to say and do. And we ask and we pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. As I shared, I went into this passage kind of with a, a lens or maybe even an, an agenda as I looked at this particular passage. And, and this lens that, that I had, I looked at this and I looked at this guy who had, had been there for 38 years and I, I was like, why, why did it take 38 years? Why? Why has he just been there? Why hasn't he found a way to get down there? What's holding him back? Maybe he prefers to be looked at in this way, identified with this infirmity of whatever it is. Was he afraid of, of what change might happen in his life if, if he were healed? So this was the lens that I began looking at this passage. And, and I looked at it, I realized later, with kind of this judgment about what was taking place. I looked at, at this man's position. I looked at what was happening, and I made some assumptions about who he was, what was happening. And, and as, I, as I was looking at this, I found several commentaries and different scholars that kind of went down this path with me in a lot of ways. And I had this sermon that I was more or less kind of prepared to, to present and given from this perspective. And I think these questions are valid. They're okay to ask. They're okay to, to look at in this lens. And so where I was began to go was, what are we afraid of God changing or healing in our life? So as we look at, at what was going on with, with this invalid, the I looked at it with this reluctance to be healed. I looked at it with his, um, his, I looked at his response to Jesus as an excuse. I looked at it that he had come up with reasons why he shouldn't or couldn't get down into the pool. I began to think, are we content with the way that we live and the way that things are that change would really mess up a good thing? And maybe not necessarily with, with the way things are for this, this invalid, but as we look at this through the lens of our own life, as we look at the things that we struggle with and we look at, at the way that, that things are held back in our own life, do we come to Jesus with everything but this one area of our life, everything but this, this particular thing? And we don't want Jesus to touch that, but all this other stuff's okay. 
And so we, we began to come to Jesus in this way. And so the question then is asked, are we content with the way that we live in a certain way that we don't want Jesus to mess other things up? And so that was, again, a perspective I was looking at this with. Another question that came to mind was, does an encounter with Jesus compel us to open our lives to him and heal every part? So this encounter, does it encourage us to open our hearts and our lives wide and allow him to to speak to us, to challenge us, to convict us? Are we willing to do that? So that sounds like a good sermon, right? And that's, that's where I was going. But then I ran across a few other commentaries that began to change my perspective a little bit. I was surprised that there was as much controversy in this passage that I found. Different scholars have different ways that they're looking at this, and and I began to see this a little bit different. The way I began to look at this initially began to change, and I needed it too. Because I think, as, as hopefully as this makes sense, as I talk about this, that you'll see the, what Jesus was up to from the very beginning. I began to look at this paralytic man who had gone to this spring or this well or these pools for 38 years. I began to look at his condition that he had hope that he would be healed. We discover in this passage that he had no idea who Jesus was. So what other hope would he have that he would be healed? So he comes for 38 years with hope. i got to confess, there are things in my life, situations that I face that I have not, with diligence, for 38 years, prayed for and expected God to do something. But we see this here. And as we go on, we're going to discover how Jesus powerfully exhibits that he is everything he claimed to be, specifically the Messiah. The power that comes along with that name and what he intended to do from the very beginning. And so to do that, I need to set the stage here a little bit. In verse 1, it talks about this festival that they were in town for. Now, Jewish culture, Jewish men were only required to be present for three festivals. The preparation for Passover, Passover itself, and Pentecost. Those were the only three festivals that Jewish men were required to be present for. John here doesn't give us a whole lot of detail of what's going on here. And in fact, I read through it, read past it, and like, I don't need to worry about that. But as I dug a little bit deeper, there's a case to be made that this is significant, what was happening. Different scholars believe that that Jesus and the disciples were present for one of the times that they were in Jerusalem for Passover. And some of the timelines do line up with that. But some scholars believe that they were present for what's called or considered a minor festival called the Feast of Purim. Is anybody familiar with the Feast of Purim? P-U-R-I-M. Now, I've heard of it, but I wasn't real familiar with it. The Feast of Purim actually comes from the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, it's interesting that there is not one mention of God. There's not a prayer, no mention of God, his name in any way. Have you noticed that? And this Feast of Purim comes from this time in Esther. The theme of the book of Esther is this, God's preservation of his unbelieving people and the celebration of that event is the Feast of Purim. So think about that for a second. Let me repeat that. The theme of the book of Esther is this, God's preservation of his unbelieving people and the celebration of that preservation of that event is the Feast of Purim. So this theme, it's crucial for understanding the book of Esther and for understanding 
why John may have included this sign done on Purim in his gospel. Begin to connect these dots a little bit. This Feast of Purim was a recognition of God, despite our hard hearts that are turned away from him, still pursues, still loves, still chases after, still has a plan. And that's good. That's a very good thing. So this Feast of Purim was a celebration of that. And so some scholars believe that the disciples and Jesus were gathered at this place at this time for this feast. So what? Well, let's get to the next part. The location and the culture of where this miracle took place is also significant. It talks about the, the pools of Bethesda. These pools actually sit outside the walls of Jerusalem. And they're considered um, by different historians to be a pagan healing shrine. Most likely attributed to a Greek healing god. Okay? I did not know this. I had kind of attributed these to kind of the city, the, the culture of Jerusalem itself, and that these were um, part of, of what God's presence did here. But that actually isn't the case. These pools sit outside the walls, and so they were considered a pagan area. People gathered here uh, for these different healing rituals. That's significant. If you notice in your text, many of you, after verse 3, skip to verse 5. Go ahead and look at your Bibles. Do you see it? Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 5. Now, you may have a footnote. Does anybody have a footnote about verse 4? I'm going to read you mine. Some less important manuscripts um, talk about paralyzed, and they waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease he had. So in some manuscripts, that part is missing. The older manuscripts it is. They believe that in later manuscripts, that was added to bring some clarity to what's happening here. But it's also misleading because it says here, an angel of the Lord. How that is actually translated, an angel of the Lord, is a spiritual being, and Satan's henchmen are considered angels. So an angel is a generic term for spiritual being. When they're attributing it to the Lord, that can be argued a poor translation here in this instance. And I'd be happy to, to share any of those footnotes with you if you are interested outside of, of this. But as we move on here, I want you to keep those things in mind. So verse 4 talks about this angel, this generic term for spirit or being. All of these things happen outside the gates of Jerusalem. The Feast of Purim and this healing. Are you with me so far? Okay. We're going to move on and come back and hopefully tie all these things together. I want to move on and talk about where Jesus has this encounter with the paralytic. He asks him, do you want to get well? The paralytic responds, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Jesus answered and said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. I looked at the man's response to Jesus as, as an excuse, like I shared with you. We see here he has no context for believing in anything of who God is, what God does. He's around other people that are in similar conditions. No one that's, that's come to, to help him with whatever he's dealing with. And so Jesus' command to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. His response to that was obedience. 
It was a display of faith. But I want to argue, too, that this is also a display of God's power. So understand the setting of where this has taken place. This isn't taking place inside the temple walls where, where God is expected to be present. This is, this is paganistic. And here Jesus encounters this man in an evil place, a place that's misled many. Jesus displays his full power here. When Jesus walked into Bethesda, it was a confrontation between himself and the pagan healing deity. With just the words, Jesus spoke to this man. The man took up his bed and walked away without touching the water. Jesus didn't even tell him to spit in his hands and rub his eyes. None of that. He simply told him, get up, take your mat, and walk. We see that the pagan ritual worked much differently. He had to stir up the water, and maybe it would happen. And it only happened on certain days. But Jesus walks in and does it on his terms and in his way. So Jesus wins this confrontation, proving that he's this the great physician, the only true God. This event even fulfills the first part and the first theme of John's gospel to show that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God. The second part of this is fulfilled with this man and his infirmity. We see here he had a choice. He had a choice. He could stay on his bed and not be healed or believe the words that, that Jesus spoke. Or he could take up his bed and walk and receive life. And we see here that he chose rightly. And then, later in this passage, we find him worshiping in the temple. I'd read past that part, I don't know how many times. And understanding where he was when this healing happened to where he went after that's significant. He had a context and an understanding of who God is. His power, God's power had been displayed for him. And he embraced it. He's in the temple, we're assuming, worshiping. There's so much in this passage, and I'm trying to pare down. What, what do we do with what we know now? We see here that God's power is at full display, displaying that he is the Messiah, the one that is all-powerful. This man never asked to be healed. Jesus proactively does this. Some scholars believe that he sought him out specifically. There's even some correlation between the age of this man, drawing it to the time that the Israelites wandered in the desert, that there's some significance there. I don't know. I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at this, like I shared earlier, through this lens of, of my own agenda, but we see God's agenda that overrides the top of that. Jesus comes in not trying to not trying to do anything else but inject hope into a situation that had little hope. For 38 years, he suffered with this. And this encounter with Jesus heals him in an instant. We see that that Jesus displays compassion. 
Because later, as he encounters him in the temple, go and sin no more. Specifically, he says, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So not only did he care about his physical condition, but he cared about his whole being. Knowing what sin does, that it separates. And so Jesus was concerned about that. Go and sin no more. You are well again. The invitation for us today, as I, as I see this, as I understand the context of what's taking place in this passage, this feast of Purim, of God's goodness despite our heart of hearts, our, our faithlessness, or our faith in the wrong things. Despite all of that, God still sought him out. God's power on display to reveal who he really was. We see other miracles that Jesus performed, and he performed these miracles, and he told him not to go say anything. He revealed who he was to that person. But this one is a little bit different. Jesus reveals himself. He reveals a heart of compassion. He injects hope. And we have hope not only in the miracle he performed, but in who he really was. And so Jesus masterfully puts all of these things together to point to who God the Father is and his heart for us. His power on display despite everything else around. When we face and encounter the things that we face and encounter, this passage should give us hope that there is a God who loves us, that reveals himself to us, that gives us hope, not just hope in the healing, but hope in who he is. And we need to begin there. If we misplace that part, the rest of it, Jesus is just a genie in a bottle. I want to invite the praise team to make their way up. This morning, as we wrestle again with this question, as we wrestle with this question, do you want to get well? And we look at it in the light of what we learned today. And we look at it in the light of, of our circumstances and situations that each of us are in. Will you allow the power of who God is to do what he wants to do? That the work of healing in your life takes the shape of what he wants to accomplish. Jesus healed this man. Healed him physically. And he healed him spiritually. This morning, as you face what you're facing, I think some of my early sermons still, still make sense. That sometimes we do hold back areas of our life. And Jesus asks us, do you want to be well? Sometimes we hold things back. We, we keep Jesus from certain areas. I would encourage you today, is there an area of your life that you're holding back? That maybe he's pointing out to you today, would you let him in? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for showing who you are. The power of who you are. That can heal us physically. 
but also spiritually. So Lord, today, you know for each one of us our needs. And as you ask those questions of us today, do you want to be well? Help us not to to come with excuses, but to allow you to work. Help us, Lord, to trust you. This man's life of 38 years with the hope of being healed. Father, help us not to lose our hope so easily. To look to you, to trust you, to completely do what you want to do. So, Father, meet us where we are today. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? We ask and we pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. If you can, please stand as we continue in worship. Stop working. We make a miracle work. Come and see for light in the 
the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are living, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Stay standing for this morning's benediction from First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty-three. Receive the words of the Lord this morning. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great week.